Many thanks indeed for inviting me to speak uh, to the CUHK ENT conference uh, 2021. Uh, it's a great honour. Um, I've very much enjoyed my association with CUHK over the last five years or so, and uh, I find that it's a really progressive uh, institution with some fantastic scientists and clinicians. Um, so thank you for allowing me to to speak again today. I'm going to be speaking about laryngeal reanimation re or reinnovation. So hopefully you'll be able to see those slides. Um, I'm actually going to be showing you work which is combined between myself and Kate Heathcote, who is a very talented laryngologist at University Hospitals Dorset, who trained with Jean-Paul Marie in uh, Paris. Jean-Paul Marie is the uh, doyen of um, laryngeal renovation, as you're probably aware. So this is Kate's team in the pool. Um, Treatment to unilateral vocal cord paralysis. Um, the mainstay is injection augmentation, as you know, which can be done under local uh, with um, endoscopic control, which is how I do it mostly, or general anaesthetic. And that can be cost effective, but it doesn't address issues where you have arytenoid prolapse um, and it's temporary. Uh, theroplasty is more permanent, although not completely permanent, because you still get wasting of the muscles. Um, even with a thyroplasty, you've got denervation of the muscles, and so the thyroplasty can retreat a bit over time, uh, and particularly as you get aging. Uh, this can be done to local anaesthetic with or without sedation, and can be combined with the arytenoid deduction, but it doesn't always correct a height difference uh, perfectly. Uh, there's the expense of the additional implants, risk of extrusion and airway obstruction, and it's not really suitable for children. It has a, a relatively high revision rate. So what about directly repairing the recurrent laryngeal nerve? This is uh, Frank Leahy, who in 1928 uh, wrote an article saying that you could directly repair the ends of a cut nerve and this would give you perfect um, regrowth uh, and function of the larynx. Um, he wrote a revision of this uh, about 10 to 20 years later, saying that actually he was wrong and that by directly repairing the nerve, you cannot uh, get perfect reanimation. And he was, of course, right on that. And that's because the nerve fibres cannot find the right muscles to grow back to. I'm going to start off by talking about non selective unilateral reanimation. So, this is where you use the ANSYS cervicalis to reanimate the larynx. There's evidence that it works in a limited but useful way, but we cannot explain the exact mechanism. Using the answer does appear to give you better results than direct nerve to nerve repair, uh, end to end repair for the neural nerve. Um, so non-selective reanimation reestablishes tone and bulk and position. So it gives you better height and pulls the arytenoids back, giving you tension there. So it actually gives you a really, really good voice and it enables pitch control, particularly if you've still got the superior laryngeal nerve intact. You can have a normal to near normal voice. And I have people who have gone back to being able to shout again after this, something that you can't do with injection, utilization, and thyroplasty. You do get synkinesis, but it's a good sort of synkinesis. Um, and it's suitable for children as well. It can be used for acute nerve damage. And in those circumstances, for example, if it's cut during a thyroidectomy um, or because of cancer surgery, then it's better to use the answer than it is to use end-to-end. -end. Patient selection, uh, laryngeal EMG. Um, there needs to be strong evidence of denervation, but not complete atrophy. So if there's nothing there, then there's nothing to re-innovate. Uh, and if you're not sure, you can do a scan and just check that the muscles haven't been replaced by fat. An MRI scan will tell you that. Allow at least six months post injury for spontaneous regeneration, and patients who are less than 70 years old uh, will do better. Diabetics must be well controlled and the patient fit for general anaesthetic. This is a study from China which was published in 2011 in 237 patients with a mean follow up of around five years. And they found that with unilateral re innovation, they got good glottic closure uh, and a straight vocal edge, which is certainly what I find. Um, with phase symmetry. Uh, there have been no uh, fully powered randomized controlled trials. There was um, one which was started in the US but stopped prematurely um, due to problems with um, recruitment in one of the centers. Uh, there were no significant differences in 50 patients uh, who were randomized and subgroup analysis suggested that younger people 
did better. So this is less than around 50. Um, but patients up to 70 still seem to benefit. The technique is under general anaesthetic without paralysis, and it's in a skin crease incision over the cricoid area on the side that you're going to re-innovate. It takes about one to two hours to do. It's actually a really straightforward operation, particularly for anybody who's been trained in head and neck surgery. It's really not a difficult operation to me. Um, you do preoperative nasal endoscopy just to check the side again and, and check position, make sure there's not been any spontaneous recovery. Shoulder bolster, slight rotation to the contralateral side. And you use the answer cervicalis. So this anatomical diagram shows the answer cervicalis, the ascendants and descendants. <coughs> it's not totally accurate here. Um, I find that the best way to find this is to look for um, the um, omohyoid muscle and the um, tendon of the omohyoid muscle. And it, the loop here is down here. It's on the jugular, internal jugular vein, uh, just above the omohyoid uh, muscle tendon. And that's the best place to find it. And you can see that here. So here's the omohyoid muscle here, uh, the cervical root and uh, descendants, uh, and the loop of the anterior cervicalis is just above it here. It has one long branch, which is the one that we tend to use uh, to this strap muscles down there. Uh, finding the recurrent angel nerve, use standard techniques as you would for thyroidectomy. Um, if there's a lot of scar tissue, then it can be difficult to find. So in those circumstances, go for the lateral border of the thyroid lamina, um, dislocate the inferior cornu uh, and find the recurrent nerve as it um, spreads over the posterior cricotinoid. To do this, you actually have to use um, a needle diathermy just to separate off the bottom part of the inferior constrictor muscle. This has no effect on swallowing. You can remove the inferior constrictor muscle from the thyroid lamina without an effect on swallowing. Uh, and then you should be able to see the recurrent angel nerve as it uh, branches over the posterior cricotinoid muscle and do a retrograde trace backwards, like as you would for um, example, a, para, a protodectomy. You can identify a suitable branch of the answer by using a disposable nose stimulator or any nose stimulator, in fact. And the actual anastomosis itself, once you've got your um, recurrent nerve and the main branch of the answer, uh, is very simple. I put in no more than two sutures, and then I use tissue glue, um, tissue glue to um, augment the repair. I uh, use a microscope or binocular loops to do that. So these are um, the kind of results that you get. So this is preoperatively in this patient. One, two, three, four, five, six. So breathy voice, diplophonia, and postoperatively, this is the kind of tone and tension of position. Look at the height of the arotenoids. Okay. This is what you really get with laryngeal innovation, the tone, the height, and something you can't really get with any other form of utilization. And you really do get results as good as that. Uh, so again, before you won't be, even be able to hear this patient, it's so quiet. And then afterwards, when the sunlight strikes the raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. And this the lady actually works in a fairground many in places. London with a lot of noise around her, and is able to raise her voice to be heard. Um, part, about 50% of my heart patients heart um, can heart actually heart shout, heart which is, again is something that you can't do with other forms of mutilization. And it's suitable for children as well. Um, it, it actually works very well in carefully selected children. So this is a child who had uh, damage during cardiac surgery uh, as an infant uh, and was re innovated So she practically has a normal voice. Can you do a nice long... So when you endoscope these patients, they've still got a unilateral paralysis, but you just need to look at the bulk and the tone. And actually their voices always sound better than the nasal endoscopy would suggest. Is 
And if you look at MRI scans um, at a baseline and at 12 months of the innovation, again, something that you're not going to get with other forms of medialization is that you get restoration um, of the bulk. So here you've got a denovated small muscle, which is um, has high signal intensity, showing that it's thinking about atrophying and turning to fat. And here you have one which has normal signal intensity at 12 months. It's the same patient. Um, you've got a new muscle back again. We did a, a, pilot, a feasibility study looking at whether we could perform a full randomized trial in the UK. Um, and we found that we were able to successfully recruit uh, and that with high patient and clinician um, acceptability, uh, we, weren't a, we didn't, this didn't recruit enough patients to be able to tell the difference between reinnovation and thyroplasty um, like the American study. But we did show that it was possible um, and, and had uh, good results in those patients that we did operate on. Unilateral selective is possible, and this is where you borrow uh, one of the roots or, or the entire phrenic nerve um, to repower the posterior cricoarotenoid. Um, and this is useful in patients who have um, paraganglioma affecting the vagus nerve. Um, there is a, an incidence of bilateral paraganglioma, and what you don't want um, is to have end up with a patient with bilateral vocal cord paralysis um, and tracheostomy. So to try and prevent that, it's useful to consider doing um, a, a selective reanimation in these patients. Um, and what we found, we've published these results, is that they actually do um, very well. So again, not perfect movement, but certainly better than if we hadn't done anything at all. This lady carried on smoking, so she's got Reinke's edema, um, but she has got some abduction as well as adduction. And a very long maximum phonation time. Uh, we um, did attempt to, to re-innovate the laryngeal transplant I was involved with in California. Um, and I performed a selective reanimation on the um, left side. Uh, there wasn't time to do bilateral, um, as we'd already been operating for 18 hours by that stage. Um, and there was swelling starting. Um, but um, unfortunately, it didn't really fully, fully reanimate. This, this video is not gonna run. Um, but we had some abduction. Um, after a few months, but then it was res it resolved into um, good tone and bulk bilaterally, um, but no real um, functional movement. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not going to be useful in laryngeal transplantation going forward. And the work of Jean-Paul Marie in Rouen um, suggests that that might be the case. So what um, he does um, and Kate has been doing in pool um, is use the upper root of one of the phrenic nerves um, and use is a split um, graft taken from uh, the um, greater auricular nerve to reanimate both PCAs. Uh, the adductor muscles are reinnervated using uh, the branch to uh, thyrohyoid, uh, which comes off separately from the answer, answer um, superior root of the hypoglossal nerve. Um, this is a long operation, it takes, most, it takes all day or most of a day to do. Um, and uh, but can result in very good results. So this is one of Jean Paul's um, earlier patients. As you can see, this was 2011, so a little while ago now. Um, Super. So she's actually got a good airway. Uh, it's not perfect abduction, but some abduction. So a very useful operation for that lady who was decannulated and 80% of the patients that um, Jean-Paul operates on with bilateral paralysis are decannulated or managed without tracheostomy. This is one of Kate's patients. Uh, 
so preoperatively. Oops, sorry, big phone. And there's again not not very impressive abduction, but some abduction and certainly an adequate airway in this patient who's had uh, bilateral reanimation. But there is some abduction, which I think you can see there. So in summary, um, laryngeal renovation is a really good option for patients with vocal cord paralysis. You do have to select your patients very carefully. Um, and it's not a difficult operation for, for surgeons who are experienced in head and neck surgery. Uh, it's something I would ex exhort you to explore in your patients because, you know, you can give them long-standing, strong voices as a result. I'd like to thank a number of people, Kate Heathcote and Emma King at, uh, in Dorset and Southampton, uh, Marina Matt Barkey, who is now Professor of Laryngology at Kuala Lumpur, who did all my analysis originally, Owen Hughes, who helped me with the Opravox, and Shonit Pumwami, who did our radiology. So thank you very much indeed um, for listening. And I do hope that was helpful to you. Um, and um, I um, I'll be happy to take some questions.